Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, on my search for great stories in tech, I recently came across a company called CapBase, which was built by founders, four founders. And CapBase is a digital backend for startups, incorporation, cap table management, stock issuance, corporate governance and compliance in one single platform. And they are a team of designers, engineers and business professionals spread across six time zones on three continents. But they're all united by a passion for dogs, coffee and great software, not to mention Dutch techno. So they sound like my kind of people. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to San Francisco, where Greg Miaskowicz is going to share his story, talk about cat base and much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah. Hi, thanks for having me. So my name is Greg Miaskowitz, or if you prefer unpronounceable Polish names, Grzegorz Mianskiewicz. I am a Polish-American startup founder. I'm currently working on CapBase, which is a startup that helps other startups start up. <laughs> or, <laughs> or more precisely, we, we build legal and financial tools for everything, for setting up a company, uh, issuing equity to employees, raising money from investors, and automate a lot of the financial and uh, contract record keeping that goes along with that. And before we dive into that and find out more information about the kind of problems that you're solving for people and businesses, I've got to ask, where did your love of technology come from? Can, can you remember what lit that spark and put you on the road that you're on today? Well, I I grew up surrounded by computers. In, uh, I grew up in, in Poland, and I remember my father smuggled back from some science conference where he bribed someone to get it. He got a Commodore 64. Oh, yeah. At, and, uh, and we would have all of the neighborhood kids were so enthralled by this. And we would all sit around and wait 60 minutes for the tape cartridge to boot up and then take turns playing Pitfall. <laughs> <laughs> Man, the Commodore 64, I remember that machine. Well, incredibly cool. And, 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 and from there, though, you ended up working in startups for most of your adult life since dropping out of graduate school. And I believe you sold a security startup called Swarm to Integral Ad Science back in 2016. But can you tell me more about that period in your life, too? Yeah. So, I, I mean, just to sort of transition, like I, I grew up surrounded by computers. I never actually studied computer science in part because I was bored every single time I took a, a class in computer science because I just learned how to program from a very young age and was surrounded by both computers and programming books. Like I, I grew up downloading software from the command line before the internet existed on a whatever 28.8 dial-up modem. Yeah. Uh, so I, I actually wanted to study, uh, become an academic. I'm very interested in philosophy and social theory. Um, and I stayed at my the university where I did undergrad, University of Pittsburgh, which has a top five philosophy department like Oxford, Cambridge level. And I stayed there for doing graduate research and like while I was I, I was doing a master's thesis, uh, I as I was wrapping it up, it, the realization hit me that people spend nine to 11 years in their Ph.D. programs living at the poverty line and getting a publishing record that makes it so that they can have a shot at getting a decent job. And if you think about the number of good philosophy professor positions that open in a given year, there are way too many PhD graduates to fill those. And so your odds of getting into a, a professor role at a university that isn't, I don't know, like Montana State in the middle of nowhere in some small town, which you'll hate yourself at living there, right? <laughs> On a night, like a good university is prestigious. I mean, your odds of getting that job are like 0.05%. The number of applicants is huge. 
And so that that's partially why I decided to to get out of academia. And I, I taught myself a lot of design uh, skills and a lot of things around multimedia production from like making music and, and mixing audio to like basic video editing. And I'd had a bunch of odd jobs. Like you could call me a renaissance man of, of digital technologies. But like I, for example, like I worked at a publishing house for Latin American literature in translation and I did layout for print publishing. I worked at a newspaper as a photographer. I, <laughs> I d- had, had a bunch of random, random jobs of that sort. Like I did subtitles and edits for films, uh, Polish films that were coming out and with English subtitles and coming out in the U.S., being released in the U.S., I did all kinds of odd jobs. Uh, and then, so it's kind of logical that I, you know, would end up working in, in startups because I figured out a, how to do a lot of things. And it was sort of natural to, to use software to solve, solve my problems. And when you were doing those subtitles, I'm curious, were you tempted to put in the wrong words now and again? I had one really funny one, which was a documentary about prison tattoos in Poland. I forget the title of the film, but like I called up my mother to ask about, like, I don't know how to translate this. And I was like, I was like, and I eventually was like, do we know someone who's been in prison in Poland in our family? It's like, <laughs> like I don't know how to translate this. <laughs> Oh, man, I love that. And here in 2021, though, you're now with CapBase. So for people tuning in and hearing about CapBase for the very first time, can you tell the listeners a little bit more about exactly what it is and the kind of problems that you set out to, set out to solve for customers? Yeah, so we make simplify the process for getting a company that is set up and running, doing all of the founder share purchases, the board set up, the employee stock plan, bank account, uh, federal tax IDs, and we simplify that process so you can get it done in five days for a standard issue Delaware C Corporation, which is what VCs, at least in the US and most international VCs typically invest in. And do you have any use cases or examples you can share just to bring that to life a little? So if you register your company in the EU, at some point, you will probably have to switch the registration to a common law jurisdiction since that is what investors are used to. If you set up shop as an LLC, that is not really uh, this uh, other type of corporation, a uh, corporate entity that is simpler than a um, C corporation or a stock corporation. That is not really investable by most VCs. VCs have limited partners that fund the venture fund. Those limited partners, you know, a subset of them are nonprofit entities such as pension funds. If they were to invest in an LLC where the profits are like pass through income to the membership, uh, the members of the LLC, or even profit interests, then that endangers the uh, nonprofit tax exempt status of those uh, limited partners in the venture fund. The other issue is that C corporations are the only entity that is eligible for what is called qualified small business stock exemption, which uh, allows uh, income up until I think it's around the limit is 10 million, but it might have been increased uh, of the proceeds from investing into a company that had under a $50 million valuation. Um, If you hold those shares for five years, then and you sell them, then most of the proceeds can be written off as tax exempt. Anything that exceeds that limit, tax exempt limit, then you can roll over into new QSBS exemptions, e.g. other startup investments and not pay tax. So from a tax basis, the, the, this QSBS exemption applies to founder shares, early employees, et cetera, but also the investors themselves. And so that is a huge tax break that Make, it makes the fund much more profitable. So th- for a variety of reasons, right? Like not investing in the, or not setting up your company as this sort of standard entity limits access to capital because only a subset of investors will be capable of investing in an LLC. Only a subset of investors will be capable of diligencing a, uh, I don't know, Polish SPZ or German GmbH. And most of them uh, will not invest in those types of entities. And 
if you think about access to capital past Series A or even past seed in many European countries, you have to go overseas to find access to growth capital. And I'm curious, you've been on an incredible journey in the the tech industry, which began on a Commodore 64 playing Pitfall. But I'm curious, do you have any uh, advice on avoiding pitfalls in the business world when dealing with equity, contracts and compliances, etc.? The general way to view things is that the market enforces standardization of deal terms and equity contracts because that makes companies easier to diligence and it aligns the incentives for investors, founders, and employees in a way that results empirically in better outcomes. And so the market enforces this. So for example, you've had in fundraising you've gone from using convertible notes, which are effectively a debt instrument, to using SAFE, Standard Agreement for Future Equity, which I I believe was was written in 2014. It was actually my lawyer from my previous company, Christopher Austin, and another lawyer at Oric, uh, I believe were the ones who drafted it. And that is a warrant. It's not a debt instrument. It doesn't have a maturity date. It does not have an interest rate. That has that agreement because it's so standardized. One of the terms is that it has not been modified from the contract that's published on the Y Combinator website. You do not need a lawyer to do your seed or pre seed or angel financing for issuing the paperwork. So the market has created a more friction free uh, form of financing document. Now, the same applies to when you think about how you're structuring equity and vesting schedules. Now, when you go to raise a Series A, the investors will want the founders to be on a vesting schedule if they're not already on one. And so they can set the clock, you know, two years in on founder vesting. And, you know, if you just had the company set up with the founders on a vesting schedule from day one, you could have uh, control when you set the clock and have more leverage about any renegotiation or vesting added ex post facto by, uh, as part of a financing round. Every time you do something non-standard here, yeah. you pay for it three times. First, you pay your lawyer to draft it, this weird document. Second, you pay your VC's lawyer, because you pay your lawyer, your investors' legal bills as part of a serious preferred financing, you pay your VC's lawyers to notice everything you did that was not standard. And then you pay a, probably a different lawyer to fix the documents during the, or fix the contracts and make things standard during the diligencing process. Or you, for the life of the company, if you don't fix it, you will be paying as part of every venture financing round your VC's lawyers to notice and ask you about the non-standard thing you did. So from a cost to the company perspective, as well as the perspective of reducing the friction to getting companies funded, that is why it, that is how we can understand why corporate docs have become standardized and why financing docs have become standardized. Think about it another way. 20 years ago, every, you know, there weren't standard corporate legal docs that were understood and uh, used across even one law firm. Like you would have bespoke financing docs, bespoke equity agreements uh, being drafted for each firm. Those days are gone because the market, both like in terms of the efficiency of legal services, as well as um, just the norms that have become solidified as the startup ecosystem grew, those, those, those days are gone. You have within every law firm templatized legal docs, you have templatized convertible notes. They're not drafting bespoke documents for every single client anymore. And you're also someone that experienced fundraising for your startup right in the middle of a pandemic. I can only imagine what you were going through there, but now you're coming out the other side of that. What were the big lessons that you learned and what did you take away from that experience? Well, I had some funny experiences because someone someone told me no in February um, before the markets crashed. They told me no, kind of they were hesitant and then just backed out because they weren't sure that an all-remote company could succeed. 
I really should just, I, I don't wonder if I have it in an email. I should just print it out. <laughs> put, we don't have an office for me to put it in. I guess I put it in my home office. Uh, the markets went crazy, but then it, there, were, there was more dollars invested into startups than ever before after basically a two-month freeze. Wow. And many investors were exposed to public markets tanking. And what they didn't want is uh, if their limited partners are shoring up their portfolios to make a big capital call when they don't have liquid funds available to do it. Because that is a huge reputational risk. Most people don't realize VC funds do not have all the capital on hand. Like, yes, they raised a $100 million fund, but that really means that they did a capital call for 10 to 20% of it, maybe, and have ongoing capital calls, especially as they make uh, big investments, they might increase the capital call. And if you look back at your career and the moment where you you sold a startup in Silicon Valley, what did you learn from that? I mean, was it like the TV show in, in some weird way? It was a strange experience. Yeah. So I ran into one of our advisors after one of our customers had made us an acquisition offer, but it was kind of crappy terms. And we ended up getting, I think, like two and a half X better yeah. on the valuation or even four X. But I, I ran into one of my advisors at the legal weed dispensary, and he gave me a ride home. And <laughs> that, and then it, it, he's like parked in the alley outside of my apartment. And he's like, "Who else might want to buy you?" Like, yeah, he, he's asking. And so I give him a list of companies. He's like, "Okay, I know these CEOs. I'm just gonna call them up." And so he just call and then that that those calls resulted in actually like two or three um negotiations for an acquisition eventually google was interested in like an acquisition acqui hire because we, we developed bot detection software so yeah. and, it, and it's real time and passive so if you think about what captcha does it requires human interaction when i say that we have a passive test that is high accuracy i i mean that we know within like 100 milliseconds of a page loading if the user is a bot or not. And we did that through developing uh, basically JavaScript code that could be dropped into any web page or an ad unit to identify if the user is a human. So you could see how that could replace reCAPTCHA, um, where you're identifying the palm trees and parking meters and traffic lights to verify you're a human. We got Google interested. Then it was oh. like five different companies <laughs> who were potentially interested. And then we ended up selling to one of our competitors in the ad tech space, Integral Ad Science. And then I, I wish I had sort of done some things differently, like solidifying what's going to happen post uh, integrating the product, because that project ended up being neglected because the we were basically put into a team that had made the previous iteration of their bot detection software. And the reason the business side even made the acquisition was because that that technology was underperforming. But instead of making us kind of co-equals or partners with this existing data science team that had their own different methodology, they just made us underneath of that team. And many people in that team were kind of uh, felt uh, they were a little bit sore about the fact that there was even an acquisition happening because they thought that the their tech was great. And they didn't know why this they, they bothered to do this. So there was internal resistance to the acquisition integration uh, from some of the people who were managing it. And it, I mean, our technology never actually worked more than like 50% as effectively as it did before the acquisition because of this. And so a lot went wrong there. And that same advisor who helped negotiate the sale of the company, he, he told me at some point, he's like, look, when you sell your company, it's like you're, you're bringing your, your, your child, your single, single parent, and you're bringing a child into a relationship. But if you break up three months later, 
um, your your significant other can fire you and keep your child. Uh, and I, I think that's a useful um, understanding. I wish you'd told me that before we sold the company, but that's... <laughs> It's such an incredibly cool story, though, and I, I just love that having interviewed over 1,500 people on here and the amount of uh, opportunities that come out moments of serendipity where you're in the most unlikely situation and then suddenly an opportunity will present itself. I absolutely love that. But uh, as we look towards the future, I mean, what's next for you and, and indeed uh, CapBase? So we're we're growing CapBase and... Um... We're getting more and more customers incorporated and companies set up. We're getting ready for um, somewhat of a big public launch. Um, we are potentially wrapping up some additional funding from a strategic investor that will be very helpful with distribution. Uh, we're also building a lot more features into the product so that companies can scale on cap base. It's not just like incorporate and set up your initial cap table. Um, we're building some of the compliance features you need uh, for uh, more late stage companies as well, like a, a SEC, IRS forms, et cetera, uh, as well as support for uh, raising a priced round in our product, um, doing 409A evaluations and a few other critical features for kind of growth stage companies. Love that. And I wish you the best of luck for the future. But before I do let you go, a question I always like to ask my guests is, is there a particularly so a particular song that has inspired you in the past, helped you on your career, helped you get your head in the zone before going on stage, or just remind you of your career in tech? What would that song be and why? A song? That's, yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> There's a really, okay, I'm going to give you a crazy one. Cool. So me and my co-founder, we we just we we were like when we were coding the prototypes for cat base, we just listened to really fast tempo, like Dutch hardcore rave music and like weird free techno records from my record collection. And there's one that stands out as a favorite, which is this record that it's a uh, this Austrian free techno sound system like uh guy released his he goes by wonka and the track is called stampa and it the the main melody is is actually a um it's actually an elephant sample and it's kind of a crazy song it's like 160 170 bpm so anyways we we wrote a lot of code <laughs> just <laughs> us and our co the contractors who are working for sweat equity on kind of the initial architecture while listening to really fast up tempo music. Love that. I'm going to add that immediately to the uh, Tech Talks Daily Spotify playlist. So I'll be I don't uh, I don't know if it's on Spotify. It's on YouTube, but yeah, is it? that's a <laughs> I'm going to track it down. I'm going to find it. <laughs> hey, and my my friends love this record. So like I I there's only like it's like a 300 print obscure record, but I think like I bought like five copies of it and just gave it to my friends. Oh, man. And, and finally, before you go, can I ask that you remind everyone listening of where they can find CapBase online and also contact your team if they are left with any questions after listening to our interview today or maybe want to get their hands on that track? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can check out CapBase.com. We answer our emails and you can chat with us on Intercom and it's usually the founders responding to you directly. Um, and you can also schedule an onboarding call or a call just to learn more about the product directly on our um, sign-up page. What a huge thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Loved chatting with you. Loved hearing your story. In particular, with that moment where you sold your company and the help you got after waiting for a friend outside the weed, the weed dispensary and getting that ride home, that will stay with me longer after this recording. But more than anything, just thanks for joining me today. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So a huge thank you to Greg for talking about how to avoid pitfalls when dealing with equity, contracts and compliances and fundraising for startups in the middle of a pandemic and also lessons learned from selling a startup in Silicon Valley. And finally, of course, for introducing me to Dutch techno with elephant samples. 
which has been added to the Tech Talks Daily Spotify list. And as always, any questions, insights, song suggestions for the playlist, whatever it might be, please email me now, techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk. I look forward to hearing from you all. And if not, I will be beaming my voice into your earballs. Same time, same place tomorrow. So thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.